dan si pagoyak ka kyo na naskup na aga be ni to tao inan ke toam hello everyone i'd like to thank you all once again for coming to listen to us let me begin by paying respects to all those first nations inuit and metis from the land of the mississaugas of the credit anishinaabe haudenosaunee and wendat nations to the elders past and present and to those yet to come i pay my respects to those courageous enough to venture across the cultural abyss that exists in this country, I pay my respects. To those struggling to protect their lands and rights, I pay my respects. To those who defended and continue to defend these lands and waters and to those who gave their lives so that others could stand strong, I pay my respects. To those who reclaim their languages, revitalize their traditional practices, and to those who maintain the old songs and create new ones, I pay my respects. Finally, I pay my respects to those who use art as the voice of our time. Please welcome Jocelyn Piranen and Jamie Isaac to Wapata's third, uh, actually it's the fourth inline conversation as part of our Indigenizing the Art Museum online virtual series in which we're in, uh, the initiative is to open up a dialogue with curators across Canada and the United States who are on the forefront of indigenizing the museums and examining institutional practices, uh, particularly in collections and archives from around the world. This series was developed by our own WAPAT uh, team as part of our global indigeneity outreach initiatives led by Brittany Pitilak Bergen, Natalia Chestapolova, and Mariah Miwasi. We would also like to thank uh, our partners and acknowledge Lisa Smith of the Onsite Gallery uh, for her ongoing partnership in the virtual platform for Indigenous art. As well, I'd like to thank the university president, Anna Serrano, for underwriting this series as well as to the Canada Council for the Arts, who've been uh, very much uh, at the forefront of contributing uh, some assistance to uh, WAPATA. So let me begin by introducing, by way of uh, the biographies of our two guests today, two young curators from the Winnipeg Art Gallery. First is Jocelyn Piranen, who is an urban, urban Inuk, originally from Iqaluktutiak or Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. Uh, she is currently the assistant curator of Inuit art at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. She graduated from Carleton University and her educational background is primarily focused on the arts, primarily in film and new media. When not, Working as a curator, she is uh, a practicing artist, particularly in film and new media. And her current artistic practice is primarily involves uh, analog photography and film, mostly experimenting with Polaroids and Super 8 millimeter. Uh, and when she's not doing that, of course, she's honing her skills in crochet and beadwork. So it's really great to see that she's continuing that practice. Uh, of course, she has contributed in her writing to magazines such as the Canadian Art Magazine, the Canadian Geographic, and the Inuit Art Quarterly, which many of you should uh, be having your copies. Uh, next, Jamie Isaac. Uh, Jamie is Anishinaabe uh, and a member of the Saugeen First Nation. She's a curator of Indigenous art and contemporary art at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Uh, Jamie holds a degree of, in art history from the um, University of Winnipeg and a master's from the University of British Columbia, uh, where she, she was focused on her thesis on decolonizing curatorial practice. Recently, Jamie received an honorary for Leaders of Tomorrow from the Manitoba Museum's 50th Tribute Awards in 2020 and the CBC Manitoba Future 40 finalists. So congratulations, Jamie. So Tungasugit, uh, Jocelyn, welcome. 
and congratulations on the most recent opening of Kamayuk. It must have been a thrill for you to open this new Center for Inuit Art after all these years. So listen, could you tell us more? Because many of us were actually watching it, uh, virtual online opening. It was really quite exciting to see uh, everybody from your director, Stephen Boris, to the local community to see everybody just wel welcoming uh, this opening of a new center, which is really on the forefront, on the leading edge of uh, what we're doing today. So could you tell us more about uh, your role in this important endeavor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it, was, it was definitely really exciting uh, for me, uh, you know, as a, as a young uh, urban Inuk and a, and a curator as well, um, to see all of this uh, come together and, and also through the beautiful ceremonies as we were showing in the video at the start. Um, yeah, the opening was, um, uh, well, you know, this building itself has been in, you know, the minds of, of the WEG uh, directors and everybody for quite a long time now. Um, and so, you know, for my myself only to, to be um, relatively new to the WEG, it's, it's been about two years now since I've started working as the assistant curator. Um, you know, I, I've only had a, had a bit of a small part to play, maybe, but um, it, it felt quite, quite large. Um, it was uh, a lot of work, you know, in, in putting this all together. And um, um, yeah, I helped out in, in uh, moving um, the, the artworks. The, there's over a little over 4,500 4, pieces in this new visible vault. Uh, I helped um, in kind of arranging that uh, into the new space and, and then also um, helped uh, the four curators in uh, opening the inaugural exhibition Inua yeah. as well. Yeah, could you tell us that relationship because it's quite unique. Uh, what we saw at the beginning, uh, thank you for the one minute film that we used at the, at the beginning of my acknowledgement. So that was part of the opening and uh, was the welcoming uh, with several people being honored at the time of the opening. So, and you worked as a, you are obviously a, a full-time staff member, but you were part of a team that you brought in from across the, uh, the Arctic. So can you talk about that team and describe the relationship between you and that team? Yeah, um, you know, I was I was very lucky and happy to be working with uh, these four uh, Inuk curators, um, Heather, Heather, Dr. Heather Gugliarte, um, who many, many, I'm sure know, uh, filmmaker Asinayak, um, Krista, uh, Krista Zawadzki, Krista Uluyuk Zawadzki, mm -hmm. um, who, who comes from uh, Nunavut and also um, the artist uh, Kablusiak. Um, so I was yeah, lucky enough to work with them in, um, you know, pretty much uh, presenting and, and organizing all of the artwork that goes into Inua. Um, and, you know, since, since these, four, these four folks are, you know, all across Canada right now um, and, and not at not exactly here. Yeah, my part really was to, you know, try and coordinate with them, you know, where where pieces are going to go and, you know, what pieces are going to be, um, what pieces uh, from our collection even are going to be uh, shown in Inua. Um, so it was a lot of coordination in that way. And, and I think it worked really well. Um, the four curators were here at the beginning uh, or mid-January to, to help in the installation and it was um, it was really eye opening working with them too. Um, you know, I got I got the yeah I got the chance to 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 work with them um, and 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 learn from them, um, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, now we'll talk a bit more about that, but first of all, let's uh, let's have the first image up because what I wanted to do was. Uh, uh, perhaps go back a bit more in history 
uh, perhaps look at the uh, Winnipeg Art Gallery. Here is the vault uh, in the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Uh, the, the gallery itself has had a long uh, exhibition relationship, not only with Inuit, but First Nations as well. Uh, the city of Winnipeg certainly has a, a large population of Indigenous peoples from across the country. Uh, the gallery has uh, had a long relationship, as I say, focus on exhibitions with First Nations. Uh, but this is an important step, certainly for Inuit, because Inuit uh, are now part of Winnipeg. Winnipeg has long been the kind of stepping uh, point or the uh, stopover, right, for flights into the Arctic or those coming down from the Arctic to the south. But before all these new developments were taking place like Kamuyuk, uh, the gallery has been involved with Inuit art for a long time. And just looking at this, this is sort of typical, right, <laughs> of <laughs> storage facilities. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, using this image, a bit about the history perhaps of, uh, mm -hmm. of how Inuit art's been treated at the Winnipeg Art Gallery? Mm -hmm. So the um, yeah, as you were saying, the the history of um, the way collecting Inuit art goes goes back, I think, um, to the late late fifties or early sixties, and that's when a lot of the uh, Inuit art, um, you know, from the north was was being uh, brought down to southern uh, cities and southern communities as well around that time. Um, so it was it was kind of uh, just natural for the gallery then to be to start collecting uh, this unique art form, um, and a lot of it then too was was mostly carvings or drawings, um, drawings and um, and you know um, oh, I want to forget the word uh, stone. Cut don't cut prints. Don't cut prints. Um, yes, yes. So, so that that sort of thing. Um, so you know, a lot of our collection from those from those times uh, would be in that form. And, and um, you know, as you can see from this photo, we we've just been collecting so much from then and uh, from from different communities as well. Um, this is just one part too. This, this is actually the, our solely our Inuit art vault. Uh, there, there's another, you know, part of our of our vaults that um, is much larger than this. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's been um, Darlene. Darlene White uh, is our uh, curator of Inuit art, and you know, she's been um, very much involved in, in <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in collecting a lot of these uh, different pieces from and, and growing our, our collection. It's definitely one of the most important collections in this country. So it's really, really fantastic to see that the uh, gallery has put so much energy uh, behind uh, Inuit art and particularly with Kamayuk. Kamayuk, uh, uh, if those of you have not heard what, what it means. It means it is bright, it is lit. <laughs> um, and it's the new art center, which we're so excited. And as I, we saw at the beginning, uh, as I said at the beginning, there was a virtual opening that was really, really quite moving with people from all over uh, contributing voices uh, and congratulations. And it was also very nice to see how uh, the local First Nations welcomed the Inuit, and I thought that was so cool. Uh, and this new building, you know, it's this addition is quite different from the old building uh, because the old building was very, as a product of its time, quite modernist, as, as those of you are familiar with the old Winnipeg Art Gallery. This new building really resonates in an interesting kind of way with Arctic sensibility. So before we, we actually have some images of the new, the new building, there was a lot of planning going into Kaumayok. So can we have the next image? Because I, I think this is sort of the, uh, an exhibition. But if you could talk a bit about the plans that went into the new building of Kaumayok, I think that would be quite interesting for our listeners. Mm -hmm. So um, 
this uh, this smaller exhibition here, it, it just goes to show the process um, that uh, the director Stephen Boris um, took to in, and took to you know even uh, begin to plan out Kamayok um, with uh, with um, the architect uh, Michael Malton. Um, you know they 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 went uh, to a number of communities up north and uh, really drew inspiration from from their from their trip. Um, it, and you know one of the uh, one of the main communities um, uh, being King Knight uh, or Cape Dorset. Um, it they they you know they they would uh, they drew a lot of inspiration from the people mm -hmm. in the in that community as well so um th this just goes to show you know the um the variety as well um of the art forms uh, that we have in our collection and uh and the yeah again the inspiration behind the building itself um and um yeah then to see that you know to see that kind of come into fruition and, and be an actual thing now, <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it, it is quite unbelievable. Um, you know, it, I, again, like I was saying, I, it's only been about two years that I've been uh, working at the WEG. And um, when I first arrived at the WEG, um, the building uh, was, was barely there. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they were really, yeah, it really kind of uh, took off over the last two years or so, and, and two three years now, um, and it, it's really wonderful to, and kind of unbelievable still to like step into this new building and um, it it's it's really, um, it's really something. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly appreciate your excitement because I've been a part of uh, other organizations that open up uh, new buildings, new museums, and it's, all that excitement uh, is really, uh, is palpable, you know, because unfortunately with COVID really affecting us today, you know, uh, the visitorship is not what it should be at this point. <laughs> but once, once it dies down, uh, I think visitors are just gonna flock and they're just gonna be Amazed. So let's go to the next image because this is what you're going to see. This is uh, the new vault. So we moved from that first image of work scattered all over the place, tightly packed. Of course, here it's also, it might appear tightly packed, but this is the new vault called Ilavut. So um, it's open storage, as we can see. Uh, many people in the museum world certainly are uh, used to go, if you have gone to Vancouver to the Museum of Anthropology, will have seen their open vault. Uh, and in fact, many museums now around the world, those particularly with large collections, um, this is really a new thing. And it's really exciting because the, uh, it's attractive. The public really likes it because they get to see so much more of the objects, you know. But in this instance, I think you were telling me earlier, uh, or you earlier said that there are about 4,500 objects in this vault. So can you tell us more about this? It's quite an amazing structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is what we what we call the visible vault, um, obviously, from mm -hmm. all of the glass that goes around it. And um, it's really quite an um, impressive structure to, to walk around. So, um, and, you know, as, as you come in uh, through the entrance, um, you, you just get to, to walk around this whole, um, this whole structure and, and really see, you know, the uh, differences between the, the communities, um, at, but also you get to see, um, you're able to <clears throat> you're able to see uh, all of the details as well in in um, in some of these pieces. Um, yeah, there there's uh, over the 
the two stories, um, there's yeah, well over 4,500 pieces. Um, I think there's uh, about 30 or so communities uh, represented um, from across the North. Um, and again, you can see kind of the varieties um, between the stones, uh, you know, from, from either Kingite or Nunavik stone. Uh, so, so that's really wonderful um, for, for the public to come and see um, and, and to experience. Yeah, um, you do. See, you certainly see the, the breadth, as you say, of, of communities across the Arctic, but also just the qualities of stone, right? The, mm -hmm. the stone that's available in the Arctic, not just soapstone anymore, but rather there's different kinds of stone. Mm -hmm. um, and then not just stone as well. Um, they, it, you might be able to, to just, just make it out in the image, but there is a small part where um, we feature the Rankin Inlet uh, ceramics, which mm -hmm. was a very, very unique uh, form that developed uh, in, the, in the later 60s in Rankin Inlet. Um, and, and, you know, most of the Inuit ceramics uh, probably come from Rankin. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, th so that too was, was really uh, nice to feature. Yeah, because when, when you mentioned the ceramics, you go, well, th th that's not a traditional Inuit material, you know. But you know, the thing that I really like is what artists can do with new material. I mean, obviously, paper, prints and drawings, uh, wall hangings, all that is new material. So why can't you have clay, right? <laughs> and so, you know, once the variety of media, the the visitor uh, to the museum and maybe online as well will be able to have access to the collections in very interesting and modern way uh, obviously contemporary ways but can you tell us because i think you've been digitizing the collections and making that accessible uh, where visitors there can actually begin looking so can you tell us a bit more of the, uh, what's behind the digitization process of the, of this collection Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, the digitization of, of our collection, um, not just, and you know, not just the Inuit collection, but our collection on the whole has been just an ongoing process. Um, obviously, it takes, it takes a long time to really, um, you know, digitize and, and, uh, and inventory, you know, each and every single piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, but, um, with this visible vault, uh, we were also um, we also wanted to have uh, visitors to be uh, to see what's on each shelf. Um, you know, even um, even see you know the artist's histories and biographies. Uh, should we have them? Um, but um, you know that platform uh, it will be coming. Um, and, and it will be available online uh, soon to, to, to visitors. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just been, again, a, quite, a, quite an endeavor to, to really digitize it all and, and, um, and also get all of this information and, and all the artist biographies, you know, it, it's, it, it'll be great though, a great resource um, mm -hmm. as well. And, and uh, just, just a nice little additive for those who are coming in, in person uh, to, to see this. I, you know, we, I mean, obviously I can't wait to see the collections, you know, um, and everybody having that opportunity is gonna be just blown away by what they see. <clears throat> now, speaking of being blown away, uh, you guys did an exhibition as well. Earlier, you mentioned at the, at the top, uh, an exhibition that you curated, uh, you and your uh, colleagues, called Iniwa, Iniwa, which uh, translate to spirit or life force. To, uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and you know, when I think of that idea of Iniwa and the life force, I think people in the South have been experiencing that life force, life force for decades, just the sheer uh, quality, not, not to speak of quantity, of course, that, that 
that is there, uh, such as we saw in the images, but the, the quality of what's come out of the North, the energy and, and uh, it's still coming, uh, uh, just flowing out of the North, even through you as a young curator. And, I've, and I'm hoping there's gonna be more young curators such as you coming out of, you know, that life force is there. And, and I'm really, really excited about what happens. But you know, I was thinking about the, uh, the other things that are going on in the North more recently, a couple of years ago, uh, up in Kingite or Cape Dorset, they opened the um, Kanoyawak Cultural Center, um, you know, and now with uh, Kamayak in Winnipeg, where there is now a large Inuit community. And so uh, with this community, obviously they were there at the opening or will be coming to the opening, can you tell us what was the, their reaction uh, with the opening of Kamayuk? Mm -hmm. it, um, so we, we wanted to have the indigenous community uh, visit the building first. That, that was um, a decision made, made also, you know, uh, possible for, from our uh, head of indigenous initiatives, Julia Lafreniere. Um, but yeah, we it was really important for us for for the indigenous folks here in Winnipeg um, to to come see this uh, first for themselves to to really um, get a get a good look at what's what's here and and what what's even possible you know in the future um, future collaborations you know with with us and um, so it was uh, for the Inuit community specifically then too, there, there was a lot of Inuit coming out and, uh, you know, seeing, seeing all of this, this very modern um, contemporary artwork, I, 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 I would hope that they would be inspired by it. Um, but they, I, I had been hearing that uh, there was, there was uh, many Inuit that, you know, um, that would, that went to see the the visible vaults, and and you know they recognized some of their family, um, some of their family's carvings, and and uh, mm -hmm. that that was really special. And that that's that's what we wanted to um, have happen as well. You know that this is ultimately you know their their family history and their it's their ancestors' work. Um, so that was really beautiful, and and again they they were just uh, really really inspired and, and kind of blown away too by by the scale of of this of even just this this one um, exhibition space. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking about the just being blown away by it, uh, it's quite spectacular the the center and the exhibition space. Maybe you can talk a bit about the exhibition space because they're quite large and open and I'm sure they just like, wow, look, <laughs> it's gigantic. Mm -hmm, so yeah. talk a little bit about this space and, and uh, uh, maybe tell us a, a few of the highlights from this exhibition in a wheel. Mm -hmm. So th this, this particular space also adds an extra, I think it was like 8,000 square feet there's like 30 foot ceilings <laughs> to the to this uh, to this room, um, which stands higher than like the, the current WAG itself. Um, so it's it it is huge, and you know when you do step into it, you there there is this feeling of just openness to it, um, and and to see all of this contemporary um, art also by by uh, Inuit artists from. Um, not only the Canadian North, but also from, we have uh, artists that are from Greenland uh, in this exhibition. Um, the the uh, Inuit curators, uh, uh, they, they really wanted to have kind of the breadth um, represented. Uh, so again, not just focusing on the Canadian North. Um, and and also to to feature a number of very very contemporary works, um, video works, um, installation, um, you know mixed media, um, clothing, um, just a variety of pieces. Um, but it it all really works together. Um, so so again in, in working with them. Um, I learned I learned quite a bit from them, 
um, in, in, their, in their methodologies uh, in, in putting together uh, this show. Um, so it's really, yeah, it, it, it really is just a spectacular show. And, uh, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully it'll be seen by, by many people as well, when, you know, once, once we get over this, this pandemic. Yeah, well, well <laughs> uh, Winnipeg is the center of the country and it's a stopping off point. So I'll make sure the next time I head out west, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, now let the next image uh, takes us a bit closer, right? And here is a piece that is I want you to talk about because I believe it's part of, uh, you know, Winnipeg, the, the Gallery of Winnipeg Art Gallery has been collecting for so many years and we, you know, that's what's on display. So we're, we're so familiar with a lot of the older material that you pointed out, the, the wall hangings, the prints and drawings, the sculptures, etc. Uh, but now, you know, this Inuia and upcoming exhibitions really are allowing you to not only showcase new media, what's coming out of the, of the north, in uh, other parts of Canada, by the way, uh, but it also allows you uh, to consider acquisition. So by way of this particular piece, I think you're acquiring it. Could you talk about this piece and then some of the other pieces that you're considering adding to the collection? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really hoping that we acquire this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there may be a fight over this one, right? <laughs> so you, better, you better get it now. <laughs> Uh, but the, no, this is um, this was one of the uh, really wonderful pieces um, that was commissioned for Inua uh, by um, contemporary Inuk artist uh, Kuzin, Kuzin Van Hoevelen, um, who's who's I believe um, in the Toronto area. He he lives and works, I believe, in in the yeah GTA. Um, but what he's so what what. What I love about his work too is is that uh, you know he takes all of these kind of very traditional traditional forms of uh, just Inuit Inuit culture um, and and kind of blows them up. Um, so so this he's um, he's created a uh, a seal skin a, a dried out seal skin, um, but through kind of rug hooking techniques. Um, and again, just kind of blew it up to the to this. Uh, I believe it's about ten feet ten feet long, um, which normally, um, you know, dried out seal skins they're maybe maybe two feet. <laughs> so so maybe it's about a third of this. Um, so again, a very very kind of contemporary work, and um, you know, not not very many other Inuit artists are are doing this sort of thing. Um, it, it's only been um, within the last couple couple of years where Inuit art, I, I, I feel that Inuit artists are, are really kind of playing with the different media that are available to them um, and creating really unique pieces. Um, so and that's, again, my kind of hope for um, the future of our collection um, with, with the new building uh, being open. Um, that, that we kind of obtain more of these kind of very unique uh, contemporary pieces from a lot of the emerging Inuit artists. Um, yeah. Well, Jocelyn Nakurmik, thank you very much. I really appreciate us, uh, you taking us on this uh, brief, very brief tour of uh, Kamayuk. You know, it's really, uh, you're whetting our appetite to want to be there very quickly and uh, to see the new, the new space, the new works, and just the energy that's coming out of Winnipeg. So thank you once again, and the best uh, for you uh, to, and to the Inuit community of Winnipeg and uh, certainly the Arctic, because uh, there's some really great things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So now I'd like to switch over to Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Bonjour. Bonjour, Anine. Yeah, Anine Yeah. 
Nemanoya, Kindish. Learning. <laughs> I'm learning my, uh, after living in Toronto, I'm beginning to feel I can speak Ojibwe or uh, Anishinaabe. <laughs> it sounds good to me. Because I hear it all around me. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, uh, well, I mean, you're from Winnipeg, Winnipeg area, and uh, but you've been at the gallery now for about six years, at the Winnipeg Art Gallery for six years. Uh, and before that, uh, you were at university, finishing your MA at the UBC Museum, of, uh, UBC, I should say, where uh, you were working uh, your thesis on the subject of indigenized, uh, indigenizing and decolonizing spaces. And I felt that uh, I needed to talk, well, obviously I need to talk to you, but it's so apropos to the kinds of thinking and thoughts that we are generating through this series and uh, and just how that's being played out in all the institutions across Canada, United States and other parts of the world where there's indigenous curators or at least curators who are curating indigenous uh, works. Uh, Winnipeg, let's let's um, let's try and locate Winnipeg. Uh, Winnipeg, of course, is uh, uh, basically the geographical center of Canada, if not the North America. It's got one of the largest indigenous populations in Canada, somewhere upwards to 80,000 folks from not only just a Manitoba area, but certainly across the prairies and other parts of Canada. Uh, it's always been the meeting point of indigenous peoples at the, uh, uh, at the Red River, now with the streets of Portage and Maine, all of that seems to point in the right direction. Um, it's also, uh, we know that the Aboriginal People's Television Network, I understand you may have worked there or briefly. I did, I did for I think about four years when it first opened. There you go, and that, that, that's located in Winnipeg. Uh, it's also the birthplace uh, of the short-lived uh, uh, the Indian group of seven, as they were once called, and uh, uh, which is a great, gr there was some great works, uh, exhibitions done on that uh, not long ago. Uh, it's also the home of one of the longest running uh, urban indigenous run, artist run centers, the Urban Shaman which is now, I believe, in its 30th year of operation. So congrats, uh, goes out to Urban Shaman. They're doing great stuff for Indigenous contemporary artists. So uh, given this kind of background about Winnipeg, um, you did one of your first shows that, uh, that you did coming in as a young curator was this one called We Are on Treaty Land. So uh, could you give us a background about this exhibition and how you came up with this idea? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I curated. This is my first exhibition at the WAG. I started in 2015 in uh, Canada Council's curatorial residency. And um, I started in September and launched this show in November. So it was a really, um, you know, quick turnaround and delving into the collection. And I wanted to think about exercising protocol in terms of acknowledging uh, the land and uh, the land that uh, we are on. So um, we, um, Winnipeg Art Gallery and, um, and honoring protocol in terms of going past the sort of verbal uh, acknowledgement that you know, institutions, uh, many institutions do, but actually enacting that protocol uh, into practice. So the exhibition, uh, had the showed the collection of indigenous artists from Treaty One territory, or that were doing significant works uh, about Treaty One territory, and we also worked with the Manitoba Museum, which at the time had an exhibition called "We Are All Treaty People," and so um, I we borrowed belongings or artworks from their collection and changed uh, artifact to artworks. Um, and all of those works were from the collection of uh, objects made in Treaty One territory. 
We also, um, we partnered with the Treaty Relations Commission in Manitoba to work with their um, elders and knowledge keepers um, to inform and influence the, what we were speaking about in the exhibition. So that was really important just to involve community um, in, the, in the protocol of um, honoring that the Winnipeg Art Gallery is on Treaty One territory. Now I noticed that uh, instead of saying you are on treaty lands, you said we are on treaty lands. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, we really encapsulates or includes um, the viewer in uh, coming into reading um, the didactic, which was also translated in the Anishinaabegmoan. And um, we also means we, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, we as in uh, a society that um, have benefited from the treaties and we as in um, Indigenous people uh, who are treaty and who are of the te territory. So it, it's uh, an inclusive word that um, really honours that sort of relationship of the treaties with the Crown and the Indigenous peoples who signed it. Yes, it certainly is. Uh... It's an idea that's really, really resonating, I think, uh, across the country. Uh, in fact, uh, most everybody living in this country is implicated by the fact that we are all treaty people. You know, somebody's, everybody's living on treaty land to some degree. Um, I also wanted you to talk a little bit because you have a particular approach and I'm really quite excited about this idea of, uh, and you talked also about protocol but perhaps it's kind of a curatorial practice or approach that kind of stems from your, uh, your MA thesis in which you talk about this process as a, uh, a braided uh, or a three, kind of a tripartite, three-stranded braid idea of decolonization, self-determination, and indigenization. So could you kind of take, walk us through that and give us a bit more of what your thinking is behind that? Sure, it's, uh, I think all three of those strands of self-determination, indigenization and decolonization are all really um, significant upon themselves, but when exercising them as a methodology um, that work together as in layers and in strands of methodologies working together is, is significant and it has, you know, it involves community, many voices, and um, in terms of indigenizing, you have to, um, you know, build on and integrate indigenous worldviews and language into these spaces. But uh, in tandem, decolonizing is part of that. So, in order to make space for indigenous worldviews, uh, decolonizing um, and educating and um, addressing uh, colonial histories and how they've impacted um, only makes way for uh, Indigenous worldviews or indigenizing and doing that through a self-determined lens as in um, Indigenous representation to speak for um, themselves. And so I think that's why it, it is so important to um, bring in and hold space and make space for community voices and relationships and um, collaborative partnerships that uh, define that self-determination. Yes, it's really, um, I see it as a very generative idea of, of collaboration of working together because it's, I mean, it's the only way to go these days. And I think more and more people are certainly working together and seeing the the efforts uh, really coming out strong and, and really quite amazing. Now, speaking of collaboration, uh, and if we go to the next image, you and uh, Jocelyn have collaborated together on a few exhibitions, and here Jocelyn is pointing to subsist. Uh, um, and so to me, it, it kind of signals this kind of collaboration aspect to it signals that the Winnipeg Art Gallery is, be, is being indigenized. So can you walk us through that curatorial process of working together in, on this project that uh, you, you worked, you've worked on and uh, 
what it, what's different about this particular approach that that you both of you were taking? I don't know. Maybe Jocelyn also wants to come into this and talk briefly about the collaboration. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, working with Jocelyn on this exhibition was um, an interesting experience to think through new lens about our collection. And um, this show was around subsistence of um, traditional ways of living. And we thought about um, Indigenous um, food sovereignty and looked at the history of colonialism as it's affected um, Indigenous health and wellness and through um, access to traditional life ways and food ways. So we, you know, had presented this idea of subsist and asked if Jocelyn wanted to um, co-curate it with me and uh, specifically through um, in, in Nuck Lens. And um, she, you know, we, we just worked really great in terms of organically bouncing ideas off each other. And uh, we were also pretty frustrated about the confines of how we speak to work in um, gallery systems in terms of sticking to the 250 word didactic on the, on the, on the, on the text mm -hmm. wall and wanting to see how we can really honor the work um, with more words and honor it uh, to have a bit of a longer didactic. And um, Jocelyn uh, works in film, as you said earlier. And um, so she, uh, put together basically almost like a Star Wars, you know how the text goes like <laughs> it sort of follows mm -hmm. it. So we did an essay and she was able to put that into um, um, in a media form so you could see the whole essay as it was going down the screen. Mm -hmm. And so we we're mm -hmm. able to have a little bit more text that way and a little bit more context. Um, and then on the other side of the screen, so we had a big monitor and the other side of the screen we, um, chose uh, news articles, um, posts on social, um, and just different media that we were able to source online. And she put together that in a in a small kind of film uh, film roll or, or or slides, and it worked to both have a visual response, but also have the textual information there. And so that was really cool that um, she had that skill set to be able to change the didactic. And we worked together to, you know, provide more context. Um, we had a lot of fun with that exhibition, uh, just in terms of, you know, um, articulating some of these ideas um, together in visual form and curatorial form. Uh, and just the conversations that we were able to have together, but also share to a wider audience and bring in artwork that was relevant as well. So it was from our collection, but we also brought in new works from Mark Gugliotti and uh, Maureen Grubin, and then worked with um, different media throughout the, the, uh, the exhibition. So um, Jocelyn, do you, wanna, do you wanna add to that at all? I just kinda, remembered what I could from our exhibition. No, that was, that was uh, pretty much it too. Um, it was, yeah, I, I also had a lot of fun uh, working with you as well. Um, and, and also, you know, always very um, kind of humbled to, to work with you too. Um, this one, yeah, it was, was really interesting in, in that um, it does, uh, take kind of the people coming to see it to really, um, you know, sit uh, sit down and 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 take take things in as well, and 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 then um, hopefully leave with um, with the thought of you know looking in, in looking into these these um, these different issues and and kind of uh, all the different kind of social media posts too, and, and really doing more research. Um, in their in their own time too, so it was great. Now the two of you, were, uh, we can go to the next image. The two of you also worked on another project 
which uh, was rather fascinating because it grew out of an exhibition, I believe, that was uh, probably predates both of you. You weren't even born when this exhibition <laughs> was on, but, uh, but it was um, uh, uh, the title. We can see a bit of it in the top left-hand corner, this kind of triangular shape which is based on the old syllabic, Inuit uh, syllabic, as well as Anishinaabe syllabic forms, which really uh, translates to the, to the self, I guess, the I, which um, I think was really about self-determination and solidarity and in a very collective reclamatory way. Uh, so could you guys tell us a bit about this exhibition because it's really quite fascinating. I think particularly this, this throwback to the 70s of another project and how it came about. So give us a little bit more about that. Sure, I think um, the, the eye, sort of the triangle or is uh, eye in both um, Anishin Inuak, Ojibwe, Oji Cree, and um, Inuktitut. So it, we were also really, we loved that the, the syllabic um, meant I. And so we really wanted to play with the idea of self-determination and that um, being the placeholder or the symbol for self-determination in, in this context. And so what you see there is the title wall and it's uh, translated in syllabics of uh, Oji Cree as well as um, Inuktitut. And we also worked with the uh, indigenous um, languages of Manitoba. And uh, where would, did you get this translated again, Jocelyn? Sorry, if you wanna pop in. So oh, um, I believe just, um, the, the, the very basic um, like south south or more common sorry more common uh, dialect um, found in the south Baffin area of Inuktitut yeah so Jocelyn and I looked through the collection and uh, we wanted to show the monistic sculptures so the monistic um, sculptural collective came out of uh, Garden Hill First Nation. And um, a really fascinating collective that just, you know, they weren't together very long, but the amount of work that they were able to do in that time, um, and they had uh, their studio space in Garden Hill uh, in Manitoba that you see here um, are really small modernist, um, sculptures in in various rocks uh, material oh, and we also of, remind us of, the, of this of these uh, this collective so this uh, they were together in the early 70s and we had the Winnipeg Art Gallery had a solo show of theirs and we still have a few catalogs left from that exhibition and called the monistic sculptures and uh, we have, I think, over 40 of them in our in our collection, and uh, we're able to work with most of them, and we brought them out to uh, have a visual uh, conversation with the works, um, ceramic works from the Rankin Inlet um, collective of artists. And in conversation, these are uh, really fascinating um, forms and sculptures. Um, that range from everything from, you know, surrealistic um, uh, forms and narratives to um, you know, philosophy and to um, insects. Like it's, it really ranges um, in terms of the, the content, but we wanted to bring them in conversation uh, in the idea of I because of their, you know, self starting this collective and also and in being inspired and influenced by um, one another. So the Garden Hill Collective um, was said to be formed because they were interested in the collectives that were happening in the Inuit um, communities up north. And then the Rankin Inlet um, artists that were doing the ceramics were apparently really inspired by um, 
indigenous artists in the South. And so uh, they had actually traveled to the Manitoba Museum to do some research um, on the ceramics and some of the pottery from indigenous um, people from the South. And so there was this sort of exchange ideas through the form and through sculpture um, that we saw, you know, just in, in seeing the work and in placing them in conversation and in proximity to one another. We also wanted to honor the fact that 2019 was the official uh, year of indigenous languages um, from the Declaration of um, in the Rights on Indigenous People, the UNDRIP. And um, yeah, the United Nations had named 2019 the official year of indigenous languages which we were both thinking it should be, you know, um, not just one year, but um, we wanted to really talk through language. And uh, so it was a bit of, it was a layered show in many ways in form and in, um, in language form. Now the next, uh, next image is from an exhibition that you did call Insurgent Resurgence which I thought was really quite fast. Uh, well, actually, maybe you want to talk about this because I think this is a, a work by an artist by the name of jo whose name is Joy Arcan, who is uh, uh, from First Nations Cree. Uh, but it's associated, uh, her work is associated with syllabic form, right? And uh, so I have an image here that maybe you just briefly want to talk about in this, in this work here. Sure, this work, uh, the yellow um, syllabic light installation came to us as a um, donation from Joy Arcan because um, if there's another image of the blue um, installation, which was in the last exhibition and uh, was, a, um, was a commission for the Insurgents Resurgence exhibition, which is at the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 2017. And um, that image uh, was called, I want to uh, learn Cree. And uh, Joy works um, brilliantly in these light installations and works with signage um, in syllabics, in Cree syllabics. And the whole show, um, Insurgence Resurgence was responded to the insurgency and resurgence of indigenous arts and aesthetics. And in 2017, um, the Canada Canadian government was celebrating the one Canada 150th anniversary. And so we wanted to work, um, not intention, but um, intentionally not celebrate the uh, Canada's 150th, but instead to really celebrate Indigenous um, arts and uh, arts um, identity. Uh, and culture. And so we did that in different ways and the insurgency of language really came through um, in Joy Arcan's work uh, as a commission with her light installation. Uh, we also worked with Scott Benesina Bannon uh, with his uh, language uh, audio installation. So there was uh, 29 artists and the exhibition took over, I think, 17,000 square feet and we were able to um, commission many artists and then later uh, acquire them in our collection. So that uh, really was the largest gal like the largest Indigenous show at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. I think had. we have another image from that. Yeah, there we go. There's another one of Joy's work. So it really fits in with this notion of the language and the recovery of language, doesn't it? Which really fits into the no notion of resurgence, right? Because you have the insurgence, which is more a political edge to it. Whereas resurgence, as you say, verges on a kind of a recovery. And uh, I think having the language going up the stairs here really almost locates it in the land somehow within the building, within the, you know, that the building speaks Cree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really enjoyed working on this site specific work um, with Joy Arcan and walking through the building with her and um we just both kind of looked up the stairs and uh it was it just came came out of those conversations 
And I think this, you know, having um, these syllabics in vinyl that that transcend up the stairs is um, it it means a little bit more just by walking through the language and um, and it's I think a metaphor in many ways too that it just really took up that space um, all throughout the levels of the of the exhibition space of the building itself and. Um, yeah, it was insurgent in that way and resurgent in the way of uh, a reclamation of, of language. Now, I want to get to a couple other projects or one more project that you actually worked on, which is called Border X. Maybe we go to the next image. So I think it really was an important uh, project for you because it really in, 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 uh, engaged in the community itself, uh, community of Winnipeg. So can you Talk about the notion of inclusivity here, for example, in this exhibition called Border X. For sure, yeah, this is a, a, a passion project for me, I think, um, just as someone that grew up skateboarding and snowboarding and later in life um, it, it tried surfing. And so um, I just think that this project has been really amazing in terms of engagement with community and really dedicated to uh, Indigenous youth and empowerment. So this work is, um, this exhibition started in 2016 at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and broke attendance records. And, um, you know, seeing young um, Indigenous and skateboarders just skateboard right into the gallery space and they really saw themselves in the space um, and it, it being dedicated space, public space for them um, to perform and to respond. So it's gone coast to coast um, to six uh, exhibition spaces or, or galleries um, and just working and partnering with different youth community groups to bring people into the space, both for the opening, but also um, through programs throughout the exhibition duration. So it's um it's definitely a heart project and it's still on the road. And um, we're working with Vans Canada to uh, have them support more programming for youth. Now, <clears throat> one more image. Uh, I know you didn't uh, curate this exhibition, but you were the institutional curator for this traveling exhibition of Kent Monkman, which was also kind of in that year of 2017 as uh, the project that you're working on, other projects you worked on. But this particular work by Kent, uh, uh, I thought was pretty interesting. It was from his Shame and Prejudice uh, uh, series. Now, Kent grew up in Winnipeg. Uh, he lived, in, uh, I'm not sure if he was born, but certainly raised in Winnipeg. And uh, he paints the scene in, 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 in the series uh, and other works, he's painted a number of works from, from Winnipeg, from the streets of Winnipeg. And I noticed this particular work, and I went online to actually find the location of this, and I found the location, and it's just north of the downtown region. And I'm assuming it's in the kind of indigenous neighborhood of Winnipeg, you know. But what he's done here is rather interesting because, uh, you know, there's a sense of uh, a Western western history coming to winnipeg you know you have these flying angels from the renaissance period you also have these picasso figures which are sitting on the steps and on the on the ground i mean it's almost where you expect indigenous folks to be sitting and hanging around this bar uh, but it's um I don't know. I, I find it quite interesting. And I, uh, what, what I found interesting, and I think in our discussion earlier, is that, you know, when a lot of people, Indigenous peoples and other peoples, you often say, well, why, why don't you come to the gallery? Well, they often say, well, I don't see myself in, in the gallery. I, I, but something interesting happened in Kent's work here. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because I think it affected the youth in particular when they saw his work presented. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I think Kent Monkman um, as an artist and what he's been able to do in his career have been really inspiring. And I think um, his whole series of the Urban Res series, which 
uh, was dedicated to the urban landscape of Winnipeg. And you see streets like Main Street, Selkirk, um, and Winnipeg's North End. And um, it was really incredible, you know, to watch. Jamie, I think you hit your uh, mute button. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Let's try that again. Um, so I think the Urban Res series is uh, was really important in the, in the exhibition that was at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And, uh, you know, you could identify the streets, um, Southern, uh, Sutherland, Main Street, Selkirk, all these uh, landmarks in Winnipeg's North End. And, um, you know, what when people, I think, see themselves in these spaces or, or see um, uh, see their stories or their narratives or um, even the places that they're familiar with, they become a little bit more involved um, to be able to want to understand um, a little bit more. And so I think having that whole Urban Res series at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, uh, we were able to bring in so many different um, groups and the programming and um, provide tours. And I think it was just really empowering to see um, these stories being told uh, from a from a, a local Cree um, artist and um, seeing through, you know, his lens, bringing more voices into the fold and using um, art historical um, languages uh, to sort of help signify these um, these histories and um, kind of conflate all together these narratives to be able to uh, bring more understanding um, to to a wider public. So yeah, we had a lot of people come in through this exhibition. Um, a lot of Indigenous youth. I remember giving a tour to the Seven Oaks School Division. And seeing, you know, these youth uh, pointing to parts in the in the paintings and saying, "Hey, I know what this means," or you know, just being able to um, bring out their dialogue, their narratives, their stories in looking at something that made sense to them. Oh well, thank you. Now I want to bring in Jocelyn. So the two of you have one more question. And uh, now that we have Kent Monkman's painting up there, uh, and while he was in Winnipeg, he was interviewed and he was quoted in the local paper in which he says, up until very recently, museums have excluded indigenous perspectives from the story about this country. We're part of the story of this country it's just that that story that exists in our museums has been told by the settler cultures that came here. So would you and Jocelyn care to tell uh, us if you feel that you are now telling these stories? Um, I think that, you know, we, we both, stand on the shoulders of many Indigenous curators before us. So I just want to make sure that that's said because um, there are so many Indigenous curators like yourself <laughs> and, um, you know, that have really paved the way for uh, Indigenous curators working in institutions today. And um, so I think, you know, we are um, agents now working in these institutions that um, have responsibility to the generations that came before us, but also responsibility to community and to represent these stories in a good way. And um, I think we're just part of a, a longer story. I think hopefully more institutions keep hiring um, indigenous and um, curators of, of BIPOC. Uh, identities. Jocelyn? Uh, 
Yeah, I would. No, I would definitely agree with with what uh, what Jamie was just saying, and and kind of add to the fact that you know now that we have um, this this dedicated space uh, for Inuit art, um, I would I would love to see many many more Inuit as well kind of come in come into the space too and and continue telling those their stories as well um, through art and and through um, well through the culture the rich culture of um, yeah uh, so and, and I feel like yeah it, it 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 is a bit of a responsibility as well um, that is on us but but also at the same time um, we're, we're, we're we are really welcoming of, of others into into the gallery space so yeah <laughs> well thank you very much um, Jamie and, and Jocelyn I think that it's uh, very courageous of you to not only to come here today and 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 to give really, uh, the public an idea of what what's going on in, at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, what's going on on the prairies, and you know how you are uh, collaborating and connecting to others uh, in the community and across this country, and and really spreading the word. And I think that the work that you guys are doing is just you know to see the next generation, as you say, I'm the old generation. <laughs> And to see such a young generation as yourselves, I really have to applaud you and, and, and so proud of both of you for the kind of work you're doing. And I just, I'll just keep, obviously I'm gonna be keeping an eye on, see where you're going next and what you're gonna be doing. So, so thank you very much, Nakurmik and Ningwich to the both of you, Jocelyn and Jamie, uh, brilliant young curators who I really enjoyed speaking with today. And the best of luck in your careers. As I said, I'll be watching very closely from afar. Uh, so in closing, I just once again want to thank the team that has been helping me uh, in this global indigenous uh, outreach in the series. Uh, Brittany Pitsulak Bergen, Natalia Chestapolova, and Mariah Miwasagi. And of course, Lisa Smith at the Onsite Gallery, who's been working behind the scenes in, in, uh, uh, in this series uh, with us. And then the president, as I said, uh, of the University, Anna Serrano, who's underwritten this series, as well as the Canada Council for the Arts' as contributions. So I'd like you all to join me next week when my conversation with Patricia Marokin Norby, who is the Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, where uh, just recently they uh, put on presentation, uh, Kent Monkman's large, large painting. So we'll be talking about that, no doubt, next week and other very interesting issues in the US and abroad. So if you wanna check out uh, the listing, a full listing of future and upcoming programs, please do so through Eventbrite or onsite gallery uh, or even the Wapata website. So again, I look forward to seeing you here. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.